Our next speaker is Sarah Hughes. Sarah runs an edible flower business from the Upland Family Farm in North Wales, where she also enjoys gardening. She says in extreme weather conditions, which I suspect we will all appreciate in the Uplands of Wales. Sarah's topic is vertical farming. Does the economic model add up? And her study tour um, was, was really to find out whether the facts uh, what the facts are behind the hype. Her study tour is supported by AHDB Horticulture. I'd just like to thank the Nuffield Farming Scholarship and AHDB for their support with my study. When my father-in-law took over the family business in the 1960s, this is him on the tractor, land prices were £161 an acre. Now, 50 years later, prices have risen nearly 5,000%. In the intervening years, our farm hasn't increased in size, but as the fourth generation takes over, we're looking to grow. Would it be cheaper to invest in a vertical farm than in more land. I started my career as an agronomist and then worked for Syngenta Crop Protection. About 20 years ago, a new boyfriend invited me to Dublin for the weekend, it's all right, don't look nervous, to a Nuffield conference. I was impressed at the time both by the new boyfriend but also by Nuffield farming scholarships. Yes, I married Philip and moved to North Wales, he sat over there. The family sheep and beef farm had diversified into tourism and more recently we've diversified into renewable energy with solar and an anaerobic digester. In 2010, I set up my own business, growing edible flowers which are crystallized and sold into high-end retailers and hotels. My business involves taking a primary product, adding lots of value to it from a small land footprint. The downside is it's very labour intensive and customer demands are high. It took me a little more time to achieve my second goal I set in Dublin, but this year I was awarded a Nuffield Farming Scholarship and I've travelled to Europe, Asia, the USA and the Middle East to try to discover whether vertical farming could offer me a similar business model to my own, but with a wider choice of crops. So let us take a step back. What is vertical farming, sometimes called controlled environment agriculture? Ultimately, it means that you can have a hundred times smaller footprint to produce the same volume of crops. One hectare can be grown on a hundred meters square. You control the water, nutrients, temperature, carbon dioxide, and light for optimum crop performance and yield. By using technology and some, sometimes automation, you are in total control. All the examples I looked at used soilless growing, hydroponics, aeroponics, and one I saw in Japan used a novel gel technique, dryponics, developed in the biomedical industry. My travels showed me that you can grow anything, anywhere, at any time, but was it economical to do so? To make it easier, I've consolidated my findings in this graph, showing the volume of crops produced against the value as I see it. Looking at microherbs, whilst being of high value, they will always be low volume due to their niche customer base of chefs and restaurants. Add on to this expensive urban locations and high labor costs. I met Mark Kazilis of Farmers Cut in Germany, who uses a dry ponic system to grow microherbs Mark's background was in the restaurant trade and he freely admitted that growing in this system was not as easy as advertised and there was a lot of trial and error to get it running smoothly. Moving across to plant, be plant breeding, which is a new area, I saw examples of this in the Netherlands and also the UK. Previously, trials that would have only had one generation per year can now produce multiple generations, dramatically speeding up breeding programs. Part crop is a new, uh, sorry, part crop means only using this system for a small section of the plant's growing cycle. In the Netherlands, the seedling lettuce company Delicious, a salad company, were fast forwarding the early stages using robotics and 
using it to integrate the seed planting. I've included vine crops, such as tomatoes, which whilst not being grown using textbook controlled agriculture methods, share many of the same issues. A tall growing area, canopy shading and soilless growing. I visited Professor Maru at Chiba University in Japan. He's the one on the left with the glasses. They are researching how to grow high yielding tomatoes by controlling variables such as light and nutrients. They found that by limiting nitrogen, they can enable higher planting densities by reducing the leaf area while still retaining yields. You may have seen this picture earlier this morning. Leafy greens are a high volume, low value crop. In the United States, aerofarms use an aeroponic growing system and claim 390 times the yield per acre. As Richard said, they've just built the world's largest vertical farm. To make a profit, this model needs to be on a large scale. One of the investors I spoke to, the Duke of Westminster's Wheat Chief Investments, felt that Aerofarms impressed them with their technology and application of data. This is the model often quoted to solve all our food supply issues, but I'm not sure that leafy greens have a high enough nutritional value to achieve this. Although I'm not really one to talk about high nutritional standards, after one trip abroad as I got off the aeroplane and saw my family, the first thing my son said to me was, Dad made us eat Fray Bentos pies. <laughs> I started my journey investigating hydroponic fodder as we have a ready market on the farm, sheep, cattle, and an anaerobic digester. This uses grains such as barley to sprout into a carpet which is fed whole. This is in California. The animals love it and nutritionists Nutritionists claim that the micronutrients are more readily available in this form. However, the current cost of silage is approximately 12 pence per kilo of dry matter, but the fodder was coming in at over 16. It just didn't add up. Plant suiticles are an exciting area. This is plant not grown for food value, but for additional benefits. Yes, you've probably already thought this already, but medicinal cannabis would be an obvious one. Or how about tobacco plants growing pharmaceutical proteins, possibly personalised nutrition of the future? Dr. Celine Nicol from Philips Lighting in the Netherlands explained to me that by manipulating the growing conditions, specific plant characteristics can be enhanced. Whilst working to reduce nitrate levels in spinach, she found the secondary effect was the vitamin C in that spinach was significantly higher than a kiwi fruit which is known for its high vitamin C levels. If you add on top of this graph the return on investment, as I see it, most stay in the same position, apart from leafy greens due to their large scale and automation which is expensive, and the fodder. So far, so good, but is all, everything always sunny in the world of vertical farming? In many facilities I visited, hygiene standards were of pharmaceutical levels, air showers, which are not as exciting as they sound, full protective clothing, and combine this with LED lighting, enhanced atmospheres, and working at height on scissor lifts, you can understand it's not everyone's dream job. In many countries, labor costs are the highest after energy in the business. The environmental credentials don't always stand up to detailed scrutiny either. For water, it's positive with up to 95% saving, but when I met Dr. Cecilia Stangolini from Wageningen in the Netherlands, I've had to practice that a lot to get that right, <laughs> she explained that in comparisons, her team found that controlled environment systems need high energy levels for lighting, heat, and ventilation. For every kilo of dry weight lettuce, uh, sorry, <laughs> you threw me with that five there. For every kilo of dry weight lettuce, they need 1,500 megajoules per kilogram of dry weight, whilst in a Dutch glass house it's only 600 due to the inclusion of solar energy. Even with renewable energy offsetting, the carbon footprint was still too large with current energy demands of vertical farms. As we all know, technology by its nature is constantly evolving, and as I travelled around Japan I saw vertical farming graveyards, million yen investments that were now standing as derelict technology. As the saying goes, it's sometimes the second mouse that gets the cheese. 
The skill is not to be the first that gets caught or the third that turns up when the cheese has been eaten. So where do I think the model works? Plant Suticles, for me, is the clear outsider. At the AgTech 2017 report, out of the £650 million investment in novel farming, three-fifths was in the cannabis sector. Seed breeding has obvious benefits, as I mentioned before, and also smart glasshouses. Esteban Romero, a Spanish glasshouse expert I met, investigated how to increase light levels by 10% in the Netherlands, because in Northern Europe, light is a limiting factor. He found there were many things they could do to gain 1% or 2% here and there, but the thing that had the biggest effect, in fact, the whole 10%, was to make sure your glass windows were kept clean, cheap and effective. In the UK, we have many examples already of this technology, from microherbs in London to speed breeding at the John Innes Centre. Here in Scotland is the first full-scale vertical farming trial with intelligent growth solutions at the James Hutton Institute. And in the Scottish borders, I visited Avocet, who are investing in a circular system growing hydroponic fodder for their beef rearing enterprise. So, what were my key messages and recommendations? Well, these systems are just growing systems like any other. They should not be the starting point for your business model. Costs should be revisited, and if there are changes in prices of equipment or energy, reconsidered. Environmental credentials can be overstated and should be questioned. And smart glasshouses should look to the lessons learned in controlled agriculture and incorporate things such as CO2 enhancement and supplementary LEDs to extend growing season where it's economic. So did I come back and set up a vertical farming business in North Wales? I'm afraid not. I have got involved in plant suticles though, and we are growing daffodils at altitude on our farm to produce galanthamine to be used as an Alzheimer's drug. Last night at the dinner, people kept saying to me, don't forget to include passion, you must include passion. When you've practiced your report many times, you, whilst being helpful, you don't really want to start thinking about anything else. But I couldn't get this out of my head, and I began to question the passion in my subject. And I actually thought my real passion was waste. I hate it. As my family, who I want to thank for all their support, know I hate wasting money. So if I left you with one comment, and I don't claim to have all the answers to this problem, if you are an investor of money, particularly other people's money in these, these systems, you should make sure that you have the right questions to ask. Thank you. Thank you.